All right. Uh, yeah. So welcome everyone to another uh, Celestia community call. Uh, this is Celestia community call number three. We have a lot of exciting updates for you. Let's go over the agenda for today. Um, so for today's agenda, we're going to go over Optimum and how to build sovereign rollup on Celestia. And then we're going to give an overview of the modular fellows program. And we're going to highlight the translation efforts on crowd in by our community members for both in French and Mandarin translation and a way for other people to, um, you know, join um, the effort in translation after and like instruction on how to do that. And then we're going to go over any kind of future updates you can expect from uh, Celestia, both from developer and the roadmap. And finally, you know, with enough time, we'll have a Q&A. The way Q&A works is basically you just raise your hand, we'll unmute you, and then you can ask a question. Otherwise, if you're more comfortable, you feel free to um, type down your message and we will um, answer it, you know, in, in the order it would receive. All right, so let's get started. So uh, let me try to find uh, the sovereign rollups. Uh, so as you can see here, um, we just announced um, like a few weeks ago uh, an introduction to Sovereign Rollup to developers. And the way you can build a Sovereign Rollup currently on Celestia is with a tool called Optimant. And with Optimant, it allows you to um, basically, it's um, a replacement uh, for like with Cosmos SDK, um, it's like an ABCI wrapper. Uh, with a replacement around Tendermint to create um, rollups on top of Celestia, sovereign rollups. And in this example, with Optimant, we created two different tutorials, um, a Wordle tutorial. So if you want to play the Wordle game, um, uh, an introduction to that, and like it'll show you how to get started with Optimant and Wordle. The other update, uh, the other tutorial we have is uh, the Cosmwasm overview. Um, so Cosmwasm is a WebAssembly um, uh, execution environment um, to allow it to build like Rust smart contract uh, smart contracts on top of um, uh, Cosmos SDK application. And with this example, it allowed you to integrate Cosmwasm directly into Optimum. So in other words, you'd be able to build Cosmwasm smart contracts using Optimum on top of Celestia. Now, um, I believe Tomas is here. Tomas, you wanna give an overview of like more in depth on Optimum and what people can do with this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, as a disclaimer, Optimum is very alpha or beta stage right now. So uh, we're, we will welcome all the bug reports or issues found because we're pretty sure that there are many issues that are just not discovered. Uh, currently, uh, Optimint um, allows you to create a rollup on top of Celestia. Um, you can, uh, there are many limitations uh, right now uh, because of the early stage, stage of the project. So uh, first of all, uh, you can create uh, a network with a single uh, aggregator node. So there will be only one block producer, um, but you can have multiple pool nodes uh, that uh, can sync with the, uh, and create an entire network to, to serve your, to operate in your role. Uh, other than that, uh, Optimum is using, uh, it's implementing ABCI, it's integrated in the Cosmos SDK app. Uh, so it's almost seamless. Um, and uh, you, you shouldn't see any difference except uh, timing, uh, the, which is related to the timing of the uh, test net right now. So uh, except for the block times, you shouldn't see any important difference between using Optimint, uh, Cosmos SDK with Optimint and using just plain uh, vanilla uh, Cosmos SDK apps. So uh, Optimint is uh, has its own uh, P2P layer. Uh, so it propagates transactions on the P2P layer between the nodes. Uh, then the then transactions are are uh, passed to a mempool, and the mempool uh, in the latest release is uh, the it's prioritized. So we have 
that's something that was introduced for the short uh, more, uh, period of time in the latest uh, tender hint. Uh, and yeah, I, I will welcome everyone to, uh, and I, I will encourage everyone to uh, test it, test test it out, and report any bugs or issues you can um, you can find. Uh, I'm also available uh, in. Uh, you you can always. Uh, uh, mention me in in the Discord, uh, and I will try to to help with everything. Nice. Uh, thank you, Tomas, for the update. Um, we have a question from Mayo. Um, while we're on the topic of, of Optimum, um, uh, so Mayo is saying, are these chains fully customizable tokenization wise if i create an optimum underlying chain will i use the celestia token for gas user own or both so right now uh, for to be able to submit uh, transactions uh, to the da layer so to celestia mm -hmm. you need to have uh, a node uh, that is configured uh, to pay for uh, for data so you need uh, as a as a um, aggregator as a block producer you need to be able to uh, store your blocks in the, the data availability layer so you need to have celestia tokens and on top of that while you're creating your own uh, roll up your own i would say chain but it's it's a roll up and uh, so it's like every other Cosmos SDK app. You will have your own token that you define. So uh, you need Celestia tokens only for uh, submission to of the blocks. So only the uh, aggregator, only the block producer has to be uh, needs to use uh, Celestia tokens. Thank you. Um, also for everyone like you know things to look forward to right now you know it's like you know Tomas was saying it's still in alpha stage we have a couple tutorials one is a simple like uh cosmos sdk game that you can play um the other one is like just a basic cosmosm tutorial how to integrate it over time we're going to have more cosmos sdk tutorials for a different thing you can do with cosmos sdk on Optimum, and we're going to have more Cosmosm specific tutorials. And over time, after um, things to look forward to, like any kind of cool application that you see in, in Cosmos SDK, we'll have over time available tutorial on how to integrate it with uh, Celestia using Optimum. And this is only the beginning. There'll be more cool things happening with Optimum after that. Um, and we look forward to showing you a lot of them. Um, before we move ahead, anyone has any more qu uh, questions about Optimum? No questions? Um, you can always raise your hand or you can ask directly on the uh, uh, chat if you have questions. And if you don't have any questions now, we can come back to it later if you feel like it. <laughs> okay. Now, moving ahead with the agenda, the next thing we want to talk about is the modular fellows. And for that, um, I want to make sure that another co-host, uh, yeah, Nader, now you're a co-host, you should be able to unmute yourself whenever. Um, so yeah, Nader's going to cover like the modular fellows program and, you know, what to expect in the program and stuff. Nader, all yours. Cool. Awesome. Thank you for the intro. And I have a little presentation that I'm going to give. So I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Okay, let me stop sharing and allow you to share. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna try to share. Can everyone see? Yep. Okay, cool, yeah, so um, hello. Everyone and I'm Natter. I work with Yaz Developer Relations. So I've been with Celestia a little over two months, and I've been working on a program along with Yaz and Nick and a few others who've been helping me out. And it's called Modular Fellows. You might have seen us talking about this. We announced it officially a couple of weeks ago, and we just closed the application process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. So 
what is Modular Fellows? It's basically a program that we have put together to really kind of facilitate the uh, building out of applications, infrastructure, protocols, and as well as maybe additional uh, improvements, or not really improvements, but you know, expanding the, the community of Celestia. And it's kind of described as a program designed to empower modular builders with the right resources to build out the future of scalable and sovereign blockchain networks. This is a paragraph that I took out of kind of our announcement, but really it's just a program to kind of give a really good experience to developers that want to kind of start building out on Celestia now and giving them access to people within the community, uh, a little bit of funding and stuff like that to kind of uh, maybe give them additional support where they might not have had it before. So the Modular Fellows program is going to be a three-month program, and we're going to be doing it probably uh, in the future as well. So this is kind of like the first cohort, and we're thinking in the future we'll have more, more cohorts, but it lasts for three months. So the participants will receive engineering support and mentorship. I'm going to talk about what that looks like in just a moment. Um, they also receive a monthly stipend of $3,000 per month to build out the project of their choice. This $3,000 is meant really just to kind of, you know, facilitate people to where it gives them enough to maybe um, just get by and pay their bills and stuff. It's obviously not gonna be a, uh, enough money to maybe um, replace someone's full-time uh, maybe salary or anything like that, but it's just a, hopefully there to kind of give them a little bit of boost and, and, and help um, and stuff like that. And after the program is over, they'll continue getting support through the Celestia ecosystem and Celestia community, as well as the team. And we're going to then hopefully help them land uh, additional monetary support as well in the form of fundraising and grants. So uh, we have a couple of milestones that we'll be focusing on throughout the three month program. So at the end of uh, the every month we'll basically have a milestone. So for the first month, it's essentially them kind of diving into Celestia and trying to figure out what they wanna build. A lot of the people that are in the program already know what they wanna build, but some people don't. So we wanna kind of give people a little bit of extra time to kind of figure that out. Uh, at the end of month two, we are asking them to then present what their initial idea is, as well as a prototype for that idea. So at the end of the first month, they should have figured out the idea and then the end of the second month, hopefully built out a basic prototype. And then continuing in the third month, building out that prototype into some type of functional product and also building out a blog post or a white paper or some type of documentation that we can then help uh, share and kind of uh, get people interested or excited about possibly investing or receiving a grant for the thing that they're building. So through this program, we are thinking that people will be able to kind of like foster and build out some of their ideas for crucial parts of the Celestia ecosystem um, that we will hopefully see come out of it. So the first, the first cohort, uh, the applications ended on August 27th. We had around 390 total applicants. A lot of very, very high quality applications came in from some of the top protocol engineers, uh, developers and founders from some really, really successful projects that are already currently in existence. So the, the quality and the number of applicants that came through definitely was beyond our expectation. So we're really excited about that. Um, and the official start of this first cohort will be happening at the end of September. So in about a month. So between now and then we basically are kind of like going through these applicants, interviewing a handful of them and trying to kind of like, uh, you know, figure out who are gonna be the, the first cohort because it's quite a few applicants. And then after we figure that out, we're gonna basically be setting up that timeline and getting communications out. So everything kind of like goes smoothly. Um, the support that the modular fellows will be receiving, uh, in addition to the monthly, I mean, the $3,000 a month, they'll also have a private telegram group for them to communicate with each other, as well as with a group of modular mentors, which I'll talk about in just a moment. We'll also have a weekly office hours for them to attend and maybe uh, be able to ask questions and bounce ideas off of each other and, and other Celestia team members. And then in Discord, they're going to be receiving a special role. And um, we're not sure exactly what we're gonna be doing with that role. We kind of um, 
like obviously it'll kind of give them you know a little bit of i would say standing out like oh i'm a modular fellow it's pretty cool but also uh we we decided to not create a separate group within discord because i think a lot of the technical questions that are going to be asked through this program are going to be helpful to the community as a whole so we don't want to kind of like box those away from everyone else we want that to be part of the main discussion so like a lot of people that our developers, you know, and, and, and doing anything really at any protocol at this point are using Discord almost as like a Stack Overflow or using Discord as like a GitHub or even a Google where you go in and you search for challenges that you had and hopefully you've got the answers to. So we're hoping that a lot of the discussions that happen in Discord will be helpful to the community as a whole and not just the modular fellows. Um, the modular fellows will have access to a group of modular mentors and, and these modular mentors are really um, experienced technical people as well as founders and uh, just people not only within Celestia but outside of Celestia as well. So people like Zaki uh, Manian, Eric Wall um, are really, really you know, knowledgeable and experienced with a very great track record. And obviously the people within Celestia like Mustafa, John and, and Ismail and Evan are all also gonna be helping out. So. Uh, there isn't really, I would say, a, a better group of people that could be helping developers build on Celestia other than this group. So we're really happy to kind of have this group that's been put together and also kind of agreed to be part of the program. So once they're through with the program, we are then offering additional support after that, hopefully, for, uh, the, pro uh, for the participants that kind of uh, have built something that they want to continue working on and building. So that will be coming in the, the, the type of uh, support will be grant, grants and funding. And then we'll also be having like an alum, alumni network. So if someone wants to continue building out their idea, we can give them a grant or help them land a grant. Or if they want to kind of like found a protocol or a project and receive fundraising, like we're gonna also help facilitate that. So that's kind of it. And I will then now pass the screen share back to yes uh thank you nader for this awesome introduction to modular fellows um i'll let anyone if you have any questions about modular fellows you can always raise your hand um or um you know ask inside the uh chat room um you know any of your question and we'll have it answered um and at, at the same time at the end of the um like the uh, community call, we we'll, we will have a dedicated Q and A, so um, we can always do that as well. Um, all right, so let me go back to sharing screen. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so the other cool thing that is happening at the same time that we wanted to raise awareness for everyone is there's been a great community effort in um, translating the documentation currently in French and Mandarin, and this has been spearheaded by a, like an awesome fellow um, um, core contributor, uh, uh, Gunter, and at the same time, uh, who's leading the French efforts and the whole structure of how translation kind of work effort. And to support him, there's Tang who's doing um, Mandarin translations, um, so to give you an overview, um, let's, um, so currently uh, we should, let me just merge this pull request, um, but if, it's gonna go live soon, but it will give you an idea of um, the documentation where you get started. Um, you're gonna find it here under community and docs translation. Um, this is gonna get updated right now just because I just merged the pull request um, and the whole idea to get started with it is on Crowdin. Um, so if you go back here, let me just get, get you the link. So there's a link for the Crowdin here that you can see. Um, I'm gonna try to show that link as well here. Um, so yeah, while it loads, let me, I'll try to share it as well in, in the chat. Um, oops. Um, so that well, yeah, thank you, Mattia. Um, uh, translation activities. So as you can see, um, currently we have uh, six languages 
um, and like the Mandarin translation is in um, at 45% completion, uh, French is at 36% completion. Um, they keep like varying in terms of completion because as you can see, the documentation keeps getting updated from time to time. So that kind of uh, changes the bar a bit. Um, and we're also creating um, currently, um, Mattia, I don't know if it's live yet, but on the Discord channel, we're gonna have like on Discord server for Celestia, we're gonna have our community translation channel. So if you're interested, uh, yeah, so we'll have it live soon. If you're interested in translation efforts, um, go on that channel once it's live and ask about how you can get started. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Igor, if you wanna get started with Russian, um, reach out to Gunter on the community translation channel. Um, I'll write down his username and uh, he'll help you onboard you, get you started and stuff. Um, joining Crowdin as a member and like uh, understanding the structure and how to like submit translations uh, for your respective languages. Uh, and yeah, and soon we're gonna have like, we're gonna merge it, uh, uh, you know, all the different translations. We're doing it uh, step by step. Currently we're gonna merge um, what is already available in French and Chinese. And uh, soon after that, uh, our, the other kind of progress, they rely on community efforts. Um, yeah, thank you, Gunter. Um, feel free to reach out to him on Discord and he'll help you on board. Um, and uh, recently, uh, yeah, definitely talk to Ting if you want to trans help translate Mandarin. And um, it's a it's great to see because as you can see the community effort happening um, over on that. Um, it's fun, like Gunter is saying, um, and you can see how people like, you know, there's so many people like supporting and translating. Um, and like, for example, yeah, um, I think they updated the UI as well here for um, the translation. Um, and yeah, I mean, Dimitro, if you want to do it for Ukrainian, would love to have Ukrainian translation as well. Um, so yeah, like uh, soon we'll, we can get started. Um, you'll find a link here updated on community under docs translation um once it goes live i think we'll be going live um in a minute or so um it hasn't been updated yet but you'll find the updated link for how to join crowd in here and just join the uh, community translation uh channel on discord and that will help you get onboarded um, if you if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, we can move on to the next um, topic on the agenda. And if you want to ask, you can ask and um, like you know over voice. Raise your hand so we can unmute you or ask directly on the chat. Otherwise, we can move on to the next um, items. Um, and the saying ever say can help with the Ukrainian translation. Love to see it, please. Um, it's a great community effort. Um, and like, you know, you know, it's a great thing because you get to see um, different people translating different items on the documentation. And soon over time, we can expand it to uh, the celestia.org uh, website and, and, you know, continue translation effort across the repos. So on um, future updates for developers on the roadmap. So one of the major updates, um, we haven't really announced it yet, but it's like it's a work in progress for the time being, is we're gonna launch a DevNet, a developer network. Um, this one is not gonna be, there's not gonna be any validator participation in this one because the focus of it is to continue having, is to have a network that is spe specifically focused for developers using the latest build from Celestia, um, core components. Um, and we're going to have more updates on that um, within the coming weeks. Um, and with that, we're also going to have a new kind of uh, uh, roll up uh, uh, that you can also get started to build on. And there'll be a lot of great content for developers to um, experiment with whether with smart contract in either Cosm Wasm or in um, EVM kind of smart contracts. And they will all be connected to the new DevNet. Um, and Mamaki, which is our existing testnet, will be continued uh, to be used for anything um, related to validator operation. At the same time, developers can continue building on Mamaki. Um, and one thing to look forward in Mamaki, if you're a validator on Mamaki, is 
we're going to have a hard fork around October. And uh, that hard fork will coordinate it with the validators on Mamaki. And that one will be the first upgrade that we're going to do on Mamaki. And that will open up a lot of doors um, in terms of what uh, is possible on Mamaki and um, allow you to build new kind of tools and um, sovereign rollups and anything related to that. Um, other than that, I'm going to, I'm going to allow, I'm going to give the floor to the Celestial Lab engineers if they want to talk about any exciting update for a developer to look forward to. Maybe I'll give it to Evan if Evan has any kind of updates on like the hard work, what to expect and stuff. I don't want to put you on the spot, Evan, but if you want to talk about it. Um. Well, we should have an upcoming hard fork for Mamaki at in the beginning of October. This hard fork will be a little bit different if you're running a node than a normal hard fork. Um, it's not fully spec'd out yet, but effectively the upgrade will involve just running a new node. So it's like you're taking the state, some of the state of the old chain and moving it to a new chain. Um, and that new chain, I, th I think, will be named something else other than Mamaki, and then um, Mamaki will actually, um, after that upgrade, assuming everything goes well, um, I think we'll actually shut down Mamaki, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Cool. Thanks for the update, Evan. Um, any other updates from the engineer that, you know, for people to look forward to on maybe whether it's QGB or Celestia Core or Celestia Node. Um, now's your time if you guys want to talk about any cool things that are happening on the roadmap. Oh, uh, let me make you a uh, co-host. Um, uh, Glib, you can, you can unmute yourself, I believe. Okay, I'm just raising hands so you see. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I just want to do a quick note that there will be a, a Celestia node release very soon. So like, please take a look at it once it's done. It's like once the, the, this new DevNet that Yas mentioned is is um, released, they will also have a new release for Celestia node. So everyone are welcome to play around and enjoy it and um, run a full node, which was not um, in the past release, but it will be in this one and it will have a lot of feature improvements. Thank you. Um, yeah, and this is kind of like our updates so far. Um, if anyone has any kind of questions, now is the time to ask, because now we're going to Q&A. So, so Mamaki is actually a testnet. We classify Mamaki as a testnet, which is more focused on validator um, operations so that validator can participate in it. And the new DevNet that we're focused on, there won't be any need for validator participation because the focus more is on continuous updates to the new DevNet. We don't have a name for it yet, but hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll have an update on that and the documentation will be updated to reflect that. So then you'll have two different networks as a developer. One is Mamaki, which is, you know, it has like a unique set of validators um, 150 validators, and you can build on that. And that one is going to go undergo a hard fork, like Evan said, early October. The other one is going to be a DevNet um, with no external validator participation, and with the aim of it to be, um, uh, with the aim of it to be um, focused more on developers building the latest uh, rollup using the most up to date. Um, releases um, from all the different Celestia components, whether it's Celestia Core, Celestia Node, or Celestia App. Um, so a question by DMARS, uh, does Celestia support educational initiatives for non-developers? Um, can you expand on that? Um, like, what do you mean? Like, is it more like, uh, are you asking for um, educational initiative on how to become a developer on top of Celestia or more related to how to interact with Celestia. If you can expand on that, Dimars, we can wait for you to type. Yeah, uh, just raise your hand so I can unmute you. You know how to raise your hand? Or maybe I can just do it right here. Let me just find, yeah, okay. Ask the new 
Okay. All right, Hello. go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Uh, what I mean by educational initiatives for non-developers is more like explaining the concepts because you know most people don't know about more modular blockchains. They just know about blockchains and sometimes they don't even know like more about that. So like educating people like with articles or videos or meetups about what a modular blockchain is and how Celestia works, but not on a developer level, but like at the conceptual level. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, I think for that, like um, we did speak about it, like when we first, um, Nader, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but we did speak about when we designed the modular fellows program that maybe future iteration of the modular fellows program can allow for um, non-technical projects, but are more like educational stuff, but maybe you can help clarify that, Nader. Yeah, that's correct. We're planning on um, in the future, possibly doing more uh, around that. But I think that like our main focus right now is, is building out all of the applications and protocol level things that we need to allow developers to build stuff. And as people are building stuff, maybe we'll then try to expand on, you know, maybe broadening the funnel of, of people that we're um, bringing into the ecosystem to like more so, non-technical people, I guess. So I don't think Dimas is asking about modular fellows. I think he's just asking about uh, educational initiatives in general. Uh, I just uh, we do have a, a we do have a we do have a section on the website called Learn Modular, which I just linked you in the chat. So if you go to celestia.org slash learn, there's a bunch of art, there's like six articles on there targeted towards non-developers to explain the basic concepts of learn of modular blockchains, which I would recommend checking out. Thanks, Mustafa. Um, and also on our like documentation page, um, let me show you guys. We have a section called concepts and in it, it goes deeper into how Celestia works, but that is more like technical. But then you also have a link to the learn modular like that Mustafa is talking about and the glossary. So it's like external link that if you go, it will take you to the learn modular section. And they have exactly what you're looking for in terms of like, um, explaining modular blockchain versus monolithic blockchain. So hopefully that clarifies it. Um, a question by uh, Eddie B. So we can plan ahead. Are there special hardware consideration for validating on Celestia, such as GPU, um, Secure Guard Enclave, I think that's what it is, um, and HSM. So we do have a specification for how to run a node. If you go to validator node and hardware requirement, I'm gonna link it to you here, Eddie. Um, that will give you an idea on uh, the hardware requirement for running a validator node on top of Mamati. Of course, my pleasure. Um, oh, can you put up the link on the non-dev info? Okay, uh, Mustafa already did that. Um, Let's go to the next question. Um, Yusin Lee, I have a question. I'm not a dev and this is very broad. Will Celestia ultimately be compatible with all chain as a consensus data availability layer? Um, so in a way, yes, uh, where if you think about it, like um, other, all the other layer one chain as um, like a settlement layer or an execution environment, then in theory, any 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 kind of any of those chains as an execution environment, whether it's a chain that executes mo move smart contracts or EVM smart contracts or like the Solana smart contract, I forget their names. Um, ultimately, they can plug into Celestia for data availability, and that is kind of like the like the vision for us, right? Um, and but whether those actual chains would migrate to use Celestia for data availability versus their execution environment being available for developers to connect to the Celestia data availability are two separate things. Um, but to answer your questions, um, it definitely would be able to be compatible. Yes. Um, next question by Rod Beiruti. I know Rod from university. <laughs> Out of interest, from what you've seen so far from the modular fellows application, what types of project are engineers interested in building so far? So that is a question for Nader. Nader, you want to answer that one? Yeah, so we've seen um, really a lot of different types. So we've seen protocol engineers, people that have actually helped build out um, other existing protocols that are like being used today and then successful. 
Um, some of the, the ideas have to do with things like uh, indexing. So indexing is, is uh, an unsolved problem. And there also doesn't really exist an indexing solution uh, for Celestia. We've seen people that have proposed building various types of, of execution environments. So that one of the things that we want uh, to happen is to have different execution environments. So seeing a lot of, uh, of those types of proposals coming in was, was really great. Um, we have people that want to build out, um, I would say like almost similar products to what, what it, were, are already like existing on other protocols. So things like DeFi protocols and, um, and maybe NFT types of uh, smart contracts and stuff have been proposed. Um, people have proposed building out SDKs and tooling for, for Celestia improvements around, you know, um, how developers might deploy and build and kind of like the whole life cycle or maybe a sovereign roll-up. So some of those ideas have come through. Um, but there's been really all types of types of ideas. Gaming has been um, one that I've seen a handful of times. In fact, we have someone that has a very, very successful track record in gaming uh, that is part that is for, uh, submitted to be part of the, the program that I can't really probably obviously say their identity until we kind of uh, decided on who's going to be admitted, but um, really, really successful uh, protocol developer of a Web3 game is, our, is, is probably going to be part of the program. So yeah, I mean, a, a very a very wide variety of, of people. Cool. Thank you, Nader. Um, hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, I'm going to allow people a few more minutes if you want to ask more questions. Otherwise, we can um you know uh close down the community call um earlier if there's no more questions maybe in the meantime we can like you know oh uh so a question by hc can someone please explain how layer two will benefit from data availability and celestia that are not currently supported by layer ones like ETH? Anyone wants to take that question? Um, let me just read it again. How else will benefit one. from the A? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't, really, I don't fully understand the question. Um, L2s that aren't currently supported by L1s like ETH. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, yeah, maybe you can clarify the question. I'm not, I'm not really. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense, make sense to me. Um, yeah, I'll try to clarify with HC. Um, yeah, yeah, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you just so we can find you. Okay, now you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, hey, thanks for allowing me to ask questions. I'm totally a, a noob and non-developer, so uh, maybe I'm asking, you know, probably the wrong question. But my understanding from reading some of the stuff, and it's very preliminary, is that, um, you know, Celestia offers data availability, um, and, you know, there's some benefits, you know, especially with regards to having, uh, you know, light, um, you know, light nodes or not non-fully nodes. But I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, as you guys are positioning yourself as the... Um, the uh, you know that layer for say the L2s. Why would they want to come to over to Celestia? That I mean, what are the benefits that you guys offer that say Ethereum doesn't isn't already offering them? And I was under the assumption that Ethereum is not offering data availability, but and so but you know obviously Optimism and Arbitrum. I mean they're working, they're running. Uh, what would be the benefit for them to come over to Celestia? Does that, does that question make sense? Uh, well, the main the main immediate benefit is higher data throughput. Like Ethereum does offer data availability, but the throughput is basically like 10 kilobytes per block right now until EIP 1559. So like Arbitrum can, only, can still only do very few transactions per second before the transaction fees go very high. Uh, but no, EIP 1559 is already launched. It's been out there for a sorry, while. Sorry, I mean, I mean the other EIP, EIP uh, for 4844. Uh, uh, okay. Is that the yeah. dank, dank chart? Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that basically, um, 
but then once that thing gets launched, then what is the advantage of Celestia over Ethereum at that point? Uh, well, we still want to have greater data throughput than, than that EIP as well. But also okay. more generally, um, Celestia is the overhead, is a, is a specialized data layer, which means we only do data. We don't do settlement or computation, which means that we don't have like, the, we don't have um, the baggage, yeah, the baggage. Having to maintain yeah. the EVM, which means yeah. we can kind of uh, specialize more on that. And that means uh, we're more of a credibly neutral and overhead minimized DA layer for sovereign rollups as well, which is something that we're trying to kind of push and cater to. So no, I appreciate that part of it. Do you mind explaining how does the uh, the lack of throughput relates to how Ethereum does currently does data availability versus how you guys do data availability? Well, I mean, the main reason right now is because Ethereum uh, kind of couples the pricing for gas and data right now, which means like uh, you have you have this you have this concept of gas on Ethereum, and it's uh -huh. like uh, the co there's no separate fee markets for data and computation. So okay, like right now, it. because applications are on Ethereum right now, uh, technically like there's on average about 10 kilobytes of actual call data space on Ethereum, if I remember correctly. Got it. So okay. like we're, because we, we don't do computation, you only, nodes only do data availability. Uh, all the block, the entire block is dedicated to data availability. And then plus we also use techniques like data availability sampling to allow us okay. to scale data throughput without sacrificing security. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, got it. And then what's the relative comparison in terms of advantage that you guys have once um, Ethereum launches Dank sharding? The main advantage is, uh, well, we f first of all, we still want higher data throughput than the end goal of Dank sharding, which is Dank sharding yeah. aims to have 16 megabytes per block. We want to have higher than that, like 100 megabytes per block. And secondly, there's still the fact that because we don't have an enshrined computation layer, we're more incredibly neutral and uh, overhead minimized the layer for, for sovereign rollups. Got it. No. I mean, it certainly makes sense. I mean, obviously, as you know, as pretty much all the industries across the tech sphere, um, as you know, as they go through mature, go through maturity cycles, and specialization becomes more prevalent to remove the bottlenecks. Um, just but you said earlier that you said that once dank sharding um, shows up for Ethereum, it's 16 or 60. I'm just trying uh, to understand that 16. Okay, so you're still yeah. a lot more relatively factors of like six times more than they than they uh, their capability is. Yeah, that's that's the kind of end right. goal of of, of our Okay, got it. Thanks very much for taking my question. Really appreciate it. Thank you for asking. Uh, great question. Great conversation so far. Um, another question by Eddie B. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I'm going to read it out anyways. Um, if the encryption used by the chain is not supported by an HSM such as BLS, um, SGX, um, then it might not be, then it is not up to the operator and Horcrux might not be usable for a selector without major overhaul since it uses uh, Celestia Core instead of Tendermint. Um, does, oh, it's, it's all good. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? Um, because I don't have, I don't think I have context on whether Horcrux is not might not be usable for Celestia without a major overhaul, since it uses Celestia Core instead of Tendermint. I can at least comment on that. Um, yeah. Our our changes to Tendermint are very minimal, and you we use the same keys, like the same key type, so you should be able to use Horcrux. Okay. Hope that clarifies it, Eddie. Um, nice. Okay, cool. Um, okay, another question by Rod. Uh, how would Celestia work from non-custodial wallet perspective? Would the wallet need to support Celestia somehow, or would a wallet just need to support the execution chain and act as a light node to the data availability uh, sampling Celestia? Um, so I can take a crack at it and maybe the rest of the team can um, answer. Um, so on the Celestia data availability side, uh, like the data availability layer, you still have like non-custodial wallets um, because um, on the Celestia network, you combine both the validator set with the data availability layer. So you do have um, non-custodial wallets that you can generate, um, but that only 
it's for validators um, to order transaction, you pay for um, block space, and that is the function of the, you know, the Celestia specific non-custodial wallet. On the settlement layer or execution chain, they would have separate wallets, and each one would be separate and you know specified by each sovereign rollup or settlement layer. Um, I'll give the floor for anyone else to add on it or like you know help clarify it more. Okay. Um, any more question? Anyone? Um, okay, so question by Michael Pro. Because there are three layers to complete an entire functional blockchain, how do new dev build on Celestia? That is a great question. So um, as a new developer, it depends on what part of the layer you you care about. Now, a lot of like in, in, in Web3, a lot of people um, focus on the application layer, like you're building app, like, you know, decentralized application on top of their favorite um, smart contract um, execution environment. The predominantly right now is EVM, where Ethereum is the dominant uh, chain for EVM specific smart contracts. So if that is your focus, um, then all you care about is building on top of that settlement layer. And the settlement layer itself will connect to the data availability layer on its own. But you as an application developer, you don't have to necessarily worry about that um, because you're building, maybe you're building on a layer two roll up like an optimism or arbitrum specific rollup that kind of connects directly um, to a settlement layer that on Celestia that also plugged into the data availability layer. So you as an application developer, that's what you care about. You don't have to care about the underlying layers because that is handled by the other um, layers themselves. But if you want to build a sovereign layer, like a sovereign rollup that connects directly to the data availability layer, um, then you um, either have to like you would have to spin up your own sovereign rollup yourself, and then build that specific kind of uh, application specific um, components of it. And that is more like if you're building a Cosmos SDK chain uh, as a sovereign rollup, then you would have to um, both create a like um you know worry about like you know spinning up that network um and you know building those components at the same time plugging it into the celestia data availability layer so that you can submit transactions um to uh for blocks to be submitted uh to the data availability layer um so because it's so modular you have so many different approaches that you can take depending on what kind what is available to you as a toolkit um so it the like to summarize the answer it depends on where your focus is um, and if your focus is lower on the data, like on like the lowest level, like building maybe API or developer tooling for Celestia data availability layer, then you can just interact with that layer. If you're if you care more about spinning up your own layer two roll up on top of this existing settlement layer, that could be your focus. Um, and you don't have to worry about the other components. Or if you want, just want to build an application on top of an like an optimism or arbitrum type of roll up that connect to Celeste, then that would be your focus. Like you wouldn't have to worry about the other underlying. Um, HC, uh, actually, let me go in order. Um, I hope, Michael, I hope that answered the question. Let me know if it doesn't. Um, for everyone that wants to learn more about that. Okay. Um, HC, is the Cosmo SDK the only template for the sovereign rollup? At the moment, yes, but that doesn't mean like that's going to be the only template. So. This is just the one that we have integrated so far. So if you go here to Optimum, um, it's just like with Optimum, it's just an ABCI wrapper. And currently the ABCI wrapper is around Cosmos SDK, but you can build an ABCI wrapper for any other kind of execution environments. So it's not limited to Cosmos SDK, but that's like for the first version, because it's super alpha, uh, an alpha stage Optimum, um, we just have it right now for Cosmos SDK, but you're not limited to Cosmos SDK. Okay, I would like to add some things. First of all, you can use ABCI without Cosmos SDK. It's possible. So you are not limited to Cosmos SDK. This is the first thing. And second thing is uh, in the future, maybe not near future, but in the future, we plan to make Optimint um, more agnostic. Uh, so it won't, right now, it's only, we're only providing ABCI interface, but in the future, we would like to provide other interface so you can 
integrate different execution layers directly into uh, directly with Optimint or use Optimint as more like a library uh, for your rollup. So this is the plan for the future. But right now, uh, this is how uh, how you build your sovereign uh, rollup on top of Celestia. And of course, you can always use um, you can always use uh, Celestia Node uh, API uh, directly and try to create a, something from from scratch. So this is the the hardest way. Thank you. Um, another question by HC is, what is ABCI interface? So ABCI stand for Application Blockchain Interface. Um, I think there should be like I can try to pull up a link for you on um, application blockchain interface. Um, yeah, and here's maybe some reading on it. Yeah, okay, thank. Um, yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, and and Josh, I don't want to miss on anyone. Um, and let me go back to the community and see if the new link is updated. OK, it's perfect. So Gunter's new uh, uh, link is updated. So here's um, this for link for the translation. You can see the crowd in project uh, link here. And, and you know, everything else, like, you know, explaining, like, um, you know, what, 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 how do you get onboarded onto the documentation translation? So check it out. Let us know what you think. Um, if you want to participate in translation, um, hang out on Discord, go to their community translation prior, uh, channel, reach out to Gunter, and he'll help onboard you for whatever language that you want, you're interested in. With that, we got six minutes left. Um, there's been a great amount of questions being asked. Um, I'll give you guys another opportunity if you want to ask more questions. Otherwise, we can end it earlier. Ah, uh, HC. Go ahead. You can unmute now. Hey, sorry. I don't want to dominate too many questions, but since uh, no one else is asking, I, I was just curious. So, I mean, obviously, from a total newbie's perspective, um, you guys are making a much more efficient blockchain and you know obviously with reduced costs and better features or whatnot but at the end of the day um you know if i was out there developing an application i want to go where there are many users and many other applications that could potentially develop from a composite you know just take advantage of composabilities and whatnot and obviously that's still going to be theorem of, you know in that world what's your plan in terms of getting that that adoption you know the, the the kink in the adoption curve where because if you i can go out there and develop an application but no one's going to come to my uh, to my chain or sovereign chain or whatever it may be but you know if i develop on ethereum obviously there's you know, there are already many users and many other apps that may want to be um you know trying to be composable to my app or whatnot well, what's your thinking on that what's your strategy I can take a crack at it, but I think I other might also have other input. So one cool um, project that the team is working on is called the Quantum Gravity Bridge. So if you if you follow the thesis that you're describing, that majority of the users are on Ethereum, right, um, or maybe mm -hmm. on different rollups on top of Ethereum, then with the Quantum Gravity Bridge as an approach, you as a rollup with a lot of users can still settle on Ethereum but get data availability from Celestia. Because again, Celestia is just a data availability network and settlement layer can integrate with it or not, or um, Rollup can use Celestia or not. Um, and I can try to get you like a link to that. But that is one approach because like, you know, Celestia follows that modular structure and architecture. Um, the quantum gravity bridge is one approach for that. And with, with a thing that we call Celestiums. But won't that, I'm sorry, but, but won't that, I mean, because I'm still using Ethereum, won't that also, when I continue to incur Ethereum costs, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot of traffic and users and whatnot, but what is the savings in that case? Or is there enough, is there some kind of a carve out where by using Celestia, uh, my total cost that the to total cost being paid on Ethereum is much less and there's a net savings or net benefit in that case? Evan, you want to answer that question? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we do have a, a blog post on this that I think goes into a lot more details that would answer a lot of these questions probably like uh, a lot better than I could here. But um, yeah, we're, you, the cost savings come from data availability costs and from Celestia being a very scalable data availability layer. So you just Is it don't possible? have to pay for it. Go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. I mean, can you please... Um... I mean, can you please submit the link or publish the link for the blog post? Yeah, sure. I'll post it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Also, I would also, I would also want to add that uh, yeah, there's a lot of users in uh, Ethereum world, but there's also a lot of users in uh, entire, I would say, Cosmos SDK ecosystem. And because of the IBC, inter-blockchain uh, communication, you can uh, gather a lot of users. Uh, there are great, lots of, lots of great app-specific chains, and you can easily uh, communicate between them and send tokens between them because of the IBC. And once you will have uh, your uh, sovereign rollup IBC compatible, you will be accessible for all of those users. And this is also a huge, uh, huge impact, uh, I would say, because it will enable um, creating, it will give the uh, easier, I would say, onboarding experience. If you can, for example, go to Osmosis and uh, swap your token or uh, to some app specific token and then send it or use another DEX in the IBC world and then go uh, straight to your, um, to your app specific roll up it would be super super nice yeah there's also like uh, again we we talk about some of this other this stuff on our blog but it's celestia is very much made for um it's made for a lot of things just data availability in general but also sovereign rollups which if you want to use a smart contract in a settlement layer then that's cool um but there are benefits to sovereign rollups that you can't get any other way and um, like you can't use a settlement layer. So if, if your project wants those benefits, then I then there really isn't another option. Okay, I want to be mindful that we're currently at time and you know, um, I want to end this call. Um, HC, if you're available on Discord, um, join our Discord. Like the team also is available there if you want to ask questions, um, whether in general or developers. We're, um, we're happy to answer, continue the conversation if you have more questions. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your question. And thank you everyone for your time and for attending the call. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to have another Celeste community call in the future to talk about any future updates that we have and be on the lookout for new cool things that we're going to uh, release and like for developers and um, things that you can play around with. And yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and I'm going to start and I'm going to end the recording. Take care, everyone.